Would you agree that life is too short to live in misery? I'll never forget that Monday night when my son called me up out of blue and he told me, Mom, I was hit so hard on the side of my head that I went blind. I've got a concussion. And then he told me the rest of the story. What he was doing was he was playing soccer. So he was marking his man on his side of the field like he's supposed to, right? But unbeknownst to him, his teammate on the other side of the field kicked the ball towards him. Well, he was so busy over here that he had no idea that it was coming. So he wasn't ready for it. So he smucked really hard on the side of the head. He went down, and then his teammates gathered him up and took him to the sidelines, as usual, and left him there. So while he was sorting things out, that's when he realized he couldn't see. Can you imagine the terror, the fear, the thoughts that were going through his head because his life changed in that second? He doesn't know how long he sat there, maybe 10 to 20 minutes. But thankfully, his eyesight did come back. And then he went back on the field. His team was shorthanded that day, so he felt responsible. Even though he wasn't feeling well, he w at least wanted to allow his teammates to sub on and off and get a break. So that's what he did until the end of the game. And then he drove himself home, and that's when the headache started. So he decided that weekend that he was just going to lie low, he was going to uh, cancel all his extracurricular activities. He was going to take care of this concussion by himself. He knew he was concussed. The only thing that he could not do was stop working. He's a very busy intermediate professional engineer. He has a lot of responsibilities. There was no way that he could stop working. And so when he finally called me more than two weeks later, Everything had gone from bad to worse, because now he wasn't eating, he wasn't sleeping, he was nauseous all the time, he had headaches almost all the time. He was a wreck. And then he asked me for my help, and I said to him, then you've got to do everything that I tell you to do. So we almost immediately started to work together, and he started to feel better right away. And so this is late August, early September time frame. And he was back at light practices with his team in October. And he was fully ready and prepared to play on November the 2nd that year, the beginning of indoor soccer season. It's been more than two years since that initial blow to the head. He has had no relapses, no more headaches, no more eye problems. Now, this presentation today is a very short one, so I'm going to be sharing with you with as much stuff as I can. But at the end of the presentation, I'll tell you how to get more information. What's really important for you to understand is that your concussion is temporary, but you have to make that decision. You have to start thinking outside the box because you're at risk of being the concussion forever. Let's review what happens today. Today you are told to rest. You are told to stop going to school, stop playing, stop working. You are told to maybe stay in a dark room and do nothing for several days at a time. Paradoxically, they might even tell you that if you fall asleep, to wake yourself up every few hours. It's a contradiction. But unfortunately, doing nothing and resting is not a treatment. In fact, it could prolong your suffering. In fact, you could be at risk for relapse even if you're cured, but it's obviously, if you have a relapse, you really haven't healed properly. So, What's important here is that I've had mothers call me up who have told me about their situations. One mother in particular told me about her very active 11-year-old son. She just couldn't see that kid 
waiting in a room for days on end doing nothing. Another mother called me up and told me about her 16-year-old daughter who was still suffering from the aftermath of her concussion a year later. These people were looking for a better way, and there is a better way. Now, we can't talk about concussions without talking about the brain. What um, neuroscientists told us 25 to 30 years ago was that when you got to a certain age, that was the brain that you had. There was no way you could change it. We were also told that you could lose brain cells, but you couldn't grow new ones. Well, through the miracle of functional brain scans, we all know that this isn't true. We now know that the brain is highly plastic. We now know that we can grow new brain cells, and we can do it on purpose. Neuroplasticity is here, and we can change it. Now, the thing about the brain is that we have our neurons, but neurons do not act alone. Neurons act in groups of neurons with, with in a coordinated fashion. These are called neural networks. Neural networks are hardwired in your brain, and really, this is how our habits come about. So neural networks are created due to continuous activation, they stick around because you have an emotional connection and with loss of repetition. Every day we are actually acting on autopilot because consciously thinking takes a lot of work. Most of the day you are running on hardwired neural networks so they feel normal and natural to you. It, all, it only takes a thought or you see something that reminds you about something and then you head on into a certain set of behaviors that feel normal and natural to you. So this is my example of how neural networks are formed. We have two neighbors, A and B. They don't know each other yet. But one day A finds B using this tool and he says, hey, I need to do that. So he goes over to B, introduces himself, and B says, yeah, sure, go ahead. You know, you can borrow it and bring it back when you're done. So A goes off, does this thing, then he comes back, gives it back, and A and B become friends. Okay, so we have a little neural network going between these two. And then they think, do you think the rest of the neighborhood might be interested in participating in a tool lending co-op? So they go off and they talk to each one of their neighbors and their neighbors talk to each other. And eventually, pretty soon, we have a, a wonderful, cohesive, cooperative, happy group of people. So that's an example of a neural network which is created by positive thoughts, feelings, and experiences. If we flip the coin over, a and B again, don't know each other. A sees that B's using a tool. He goes over there, asks B if he can borrow it. B says, sure, go ahead. And so A goes off and does this thing. And then he realizes, hey, I can do a whole lot of stuff with this. I think I'll keep this. Of course, B has no idea that this is going on until the day that he's looking for it. He needs it, but it's not in its usual place in the garage. So he tears up the garage looking for this thing. And then he remembers, oh yeah, A's got it. I'll just go over there and ask him for it. So, <laughs> so he goes over there, but A will have nothing to do with him. He avoids him. He won't talk to him. By now, B is not just confused. He's angry. And the more he thinks about the situation, he's not going to see his tools anymore. The more upset, the more stressed out he gets. And the more he thinks about it, the more I'm upset. And maybe at some point he says, I can't trust anybody. So this is an example of creating a neural network due to negative thoughts, feelings, and experiences. We do have to talk about stress. Because stress has a known effect on the body and also on the brain. 
The definition for stress is very simply thinking and feeling negatively a lot of the time. And stress is particularly harmful to the brain. Stress hormones will flood the brain. And we have a couple of parts here, the hippocampus and the hypothalamus. The hippocampus is very important. It's a very small part of the brain. But it regulates our memory, our learning, and our emotions. When the hippocampus is healthy, that's where most of our new neurons are generated. And when it's healthy, that is when it talks to the hypothalamus and it tells the body to stop secreting stress hormones when it reaches a certain level. But when somebody is under a lot of chronic stress, when they're chronically unhappy, and everybody knows when they're unhappy, the, hypo, the hippocampus starts to shrink, and it stops doing the job of telling the hypothalamus to stop secreting those stress hormones. So if you have a hard time calming down after a stressful bout, that's a big sign of what's happening inside your brain. So we need to reprogram the brain in order to help that concussion. You have to start being conscious of what you're thinking and feeling and feeling and thinking because that is the key to healing your concussion. It's your psychological wellness that's important. In other words, you have to use your brain in order to heal your brain. That's the power of neuroplasticity. So again, I'm going to be sharing a few tools with you, a different way of thinking. And at the end of the presentation, I'll tell you how to get more information. But we have to look at what our priorities are. That's the first thing. What's your very top priority in life? What's important to you guys? Be happy. Good. Anything else? Healthy. Yes. Very good. Great. Your number one priority should be your health and your happiness. Number two priority should be your family. And number three should be your career or your job. It's pretty easy, because if you don't take care of number one, <laughs> number one, then you cannot take care of number two and number three. For instance, if you're too sick to work, what would happen to your family? What would happen to your job and career aspirations? So you got to take care of number one. OK, what motivates you? You need to know why you want to be well again, and you need to have a goal. Like everything else in life, if you know what and you know why, then you can succeed. You have to add meaning to what it is that you want. The other thing is, is that you have to start thinking about what you can do instead of what you cannot do. Big difference. My son had three motivations. Before his concussion that summer, he had already planned and paid for six different ski trips in the Canadian Rockies that winter. So besides losing all that money, he'd also have to watch his friends go off without him. Soccer is his favorite sport. He's been playing ever since he was six years old. And he was definitely looking forward to the indoor soccer season that year. So there's no way he wanted to miss that. And then there's work. He loves his job. He loves what he does there. But he's also a single guy with his own home. He has to work. Let's go over some do's and don'ts. First, the do's. Make your first priority your health and your happiness, just like that brilliant lady over there. Do pay attention to what you're thinking and feeling. you got to be conscious. And be happy. And do you know when you're happy? 
when you have made the right decisions for yourself and you're thinking the right thoughts, you immediately feel happy. That's a big clue. The don'ts are do not be afraid of your concussion and certainly do not embrace it. Because these are two neural networks that definitely prevent a person from becoming well again. And especially the embrace, because embrace means you love something, and I'm sure you are not in love with your concussion. So don't listen to the, any of the bad news and the hype around concussions, unless you want to be one of their statistics. OK? You don't want to be part of that party. So I'm going to discuss a tool with you. It's a really great little stress-busting exercise. But first, we're going to talk about control. What do you really have control over in your life? Any takers? The way I think. OK, good. Very good. Definitely, we have control over ourselves. Specifically, we have control over what we think, do, say, the results we get, the actions we take, decisions we make. Equally important is what we don't have control over. And this is a big one, because we have no control over other people, animals, situations, and events. What are we responsible for? Anyone? We're responsible for ourselves. And again, specifically, we are responsible for what we say, do, think, and the results we get. Again, what are we not responsible for? We are not responsible for someone else and what they think, say, do, and the results they get. The only exception is if we are bringing up children. And then we are responsible to and for them until the age of majority. And then after that, you have to start letting go. So this little stress-busting exercise is about worry, because most of us are worried about a number of things. So headache is part of that definition. Concussions come with headaches. What, is, what are the headaches in your life that you haven't dealt with yet? Because there's definitely a deeper meaning here. So we're going to create a spreadsheet. It's going to have three columns. The first column you label as worry. Next one is who has control over this and who's responsible for it. So under the column worry, you list all your worries and deep concerns. And then you write down beside it the name of the person that's controlling or responsible for it, all the way down. And when you're done with that, you look at your list. And for each worry that doesn't have your name on it, you cross it out. You have no business being there. In fact, it's none of your business. When you're done with that, then you look at what's left. And for each worry that you have listed there that's left, you ask this question. What evidence do I have that something bad is going to happen here? What evidence do I have that something bad is going to happen here? And if nothing comes to your brain right away, and, or you have to think really hard about it, then it's not a real concern. So that goes away, too. With my one-on-one -on -one clients, they will usually come up with one major issue that absolutely needs their energy, sometimes two. And then we draw up a plan of action, and uh, they go off and execute the steps, and then I act, among other things, as an accountability partner. For my son, we identified his problem being at work. Now, remember I said he loves his job? Well, several months before his concussion, the company hired a brand new manager. And this guy, in his very first staff meeting, told his young engineers, I want to be your friend. 
It didn't go over well because obviously they were looking for a leader. It was so bad that Nolan's best buddy said, I'm quitting. And he did, and he left. But Nolan loves working there. He doesn't want to leave. But he didn't want to work for this guy either. So he, he was so upset and so stressed out by what was going on, he felt he had no control. So he was very, very unhappy. And so remember I told you that I had told him that you've got to do everything that I tell you to do? Well, one of the things that we talked about was, OK, you're the guy in pain. You're the guy who's got the problem. This guy has no clue what you're going through. And maybe he doesn't even care. So I want you to do this. I want you to set up one-on-one, face-to-face -on -one, meetings with this guy. And you're going to ask him for what you want. Now, there are a couple of risks here. Because Nolan could have refused. Because he's a quiet guy. He's not like me. Okay? He's not his mother. So he could have refused to do it. And his other risk was, even if he did do it, this manager would just blow him off. You know, he'd just ignore him. I don't care, right? But Nolan put his first priority as his health and his happiness. And he got better because he felt better, because he was taking control of the situation instead of it taking control of him. He was extremely determined. OK, four, over four years ago, we found out that Brazil was going to host the World Cup in 2014. So Nolan and I went, yes, we're going. My husband and my younger son, not so much. But we planned on having a family trip. So August 2013 comes around. FIFA is about to open up their ticket um, lottery. <coughs> And so as a family, we got together and came up with our criteria for this trip. But of course, Nolan and I did most of the planning and the work. And so we had decided that, OK, we're going to go to the games after the group stage. We're, going to, uh, we're not going to follow a team. We're just going to stick around in one location. So we picked Fortaleza, which is hot and sunny and steamy all year round, even during a Brazil winter. And of course, uh, so in between, we wanted accommodations close to a beach. And then we decided, well, I said, OK, we're going to go regardless of where, whether we get tickets or not. So we had uh, our accommodation and our ticket flights. Everything was booked by September, October 2013. We were totally committed, even though we had no idea what teams were going to be playing. And then we decided that we were going to ignore all the bad news around these events, because there's usually bad news around these big events. And uh, also decided to invite some fantastic, equally Brazil crazy soccer fan friends of ours to meet us in Fortaleza. So here we are at the Sao Paulo airport on June 27th, 2014. And this is Nolan. And here we are at Estadio Castelao in Fortaleza on our way with our great friends to watch the quarterfinal match between Brazil and Colombia. It was awesome. And here is Nolan. Here is Nolan with a big smile because he is doing exactly what he wants at exactly the moment that he wants to do it. And so now. It's time for you. It's time for you to make a decision. It's time for you to do something about that concussion. Because you can. Nothing is ever done by accident. The thing is, is that you can use the power of neuroplasticity because the brain is so malleable. It's so easy to change it. It really is. You just need a bit of guidance to do it. So...